Hello, Darren here. Just a quick note before we get started. This is a long one, like 20 minutes long, but I encourage you to watch it the whole way through. We cover identification, application, inspection of one of these things, and also some install pros and cons and some considerations with owning a Kenny Bell supercharger. So before you buy one, watch this entire video. And if you think of any questions, throw them down in the comments below. We'll do and ask me anything and I'll put together a video that addresses all of your questions based on my 13 years of experience with this supercharger on my own vehicle. Thanks very much and let's get to it. Hello and welcome. I'm Darren and this is the SN95 Owner's Guide and today we're going to be talking about Kenny Bell Superchargers. In front of me is my own Kenny Bell 2.2 liter twin screw supercharger. It's both the Flowzilla and the Blowzilla, which is an interesting thing that we'll cover as we go through all the parts of this. This is off of my own 1995 Mustang GTS. I purchased it brand new from Kenny Bell in 2008, and I've had it on ever since. It's been a really interesting blower. There's a lot of myth and lore, and if you're looking for stuff to figure out whether you should buy one of these on the used market, this is probably the video for you. Now these superchargers have been out of production for quite a long time. They've simply been superseded by newer models for newer Mustangs and other market vehicles. And it's important to understand what exactly we're looking at when it comes to a Kenny Bell. On this side, we've got the compressor housing. These come in many different sizes. We have a 1.5 liter, a 1.7 liter, a 2.2 liter, and a 2.1 as far as the five liter applications go. On this side over here, we have our inlet. Our inlet manifold comes in two different sizes. We have the standard inlet, which is quite small, and then we have the larger Flowzilla. This is the one I have here. That can accept up to a 90 millimeter throttle body housing, and that's the distinctive difference. It lets in way more air, allows higher boost levels, higher power production. You'll notice on this side, we see the ubiquitous Fox style throttle body. And this throttle body, you either have to convert to a Fox style throttle body or supply your own elbow. But be warned, if your elbow is smaller than your inlet, you're going to have a flow restriction and the blower is not going to perform as well. Then on the discharge side of the blower, we have the intake manifold that goes into your lower intake, either your standard or your Cobra. Basically, the flow is, is air comes in through the throttle body and your inlet, moves around through the inlet into the back of the twin screws where it is compressed and then it is top discharge on a five liter push rod compared to modulars where it's a bottom discharge. And then your discharge comes through here. This is where your boosted air lives and that will go straight down into the engine's manifold. You'll also notice this device here. This is a boost bypass. This was an optional up feature that was found on many of the Flowzillas, but also standards. And in the standard fitment, you would have a device over here. You would have a long bit of piping that would come over here is what that would do is that would circulate air whenever you're not at wide open throttle. And this supercharger, it is boosting anytime the engine is running. And is what this device does is it allows that boost to release, to bleed off and to go back into the inlet assembly and be recycled again. That keeps blower temps down, that keeps air temps down, and it also reduces fuel economy. It's a really valuable thing to have and not many of the blowers came with it because it was a pretty hefty upcharge back in the day. Now, when we look for a Kenny Bell kit, the term kit doesn't really give you the same things that you would expect out of a modern day piece. As production was wrapping up on these, they pretty much went entirely to a tuner kit style model, meaning you didn't have tuning, you didn't have fuel, and you didn't have spark or ignition related solutions. You had to supply those yourself. And that was exactly the case that I had when I got this one. Is what you do get is you get generally a fully assembled inlet manifold, you get your discharge manifold, you get your blower, your support bracket, you get a coil relocation bracket, and a few other bits and pieces. You get a belt, a coolant hose, a thermostat, uh, a couple of pulleys if you ordered extra ones, and a pulley changing wrench if you paid extra for that. Aside from that, you were on your own for supplying fuel and air and calibration, any of your tuning solutions. That was entirely up to you. The fitment on this looked pretty easy. You read the instruction manual, which I do have a copy. If you'd like that, just outreach in the comments and I'll find a way to get you a PDF. But going through the manual, it simply looks like remove your old intake manifold, put this Kenny Bell in its place, bolt it down, run the belt, and from there, you have a boosted engine. And in short, that's really what it's down to. But in practicality, actually fitting this thing is a little bit of trouble, or at least in my experience. 
There's a couple of spots that I had to rub. Here in the front, I had to adjust my snout support bracket in order for it to interface with the power steering bracket correctly. I had to oblong those holes, not a big deal. A more severe issue was the fact that I had trick flow heads, and trick flow heads have a little bit higher valve cover rail to allow you to clear a roller rocker, which is necessary for those heads, with a much smaller valve cover. That valve cover ended up fouling the bottom part of the blower. Basically, they couldn't coexist. I couldn't bolt my blower down and have a valve cover in place. So you have two options from there. You have to either get a spacer, which then puts the blower higher up on the engine between the intake manifold and its discharge manifold. But then you have to engineer a spacer for your front support snout bracket. And then additionally in the back, you have the pinch weld where the strut tower brace would mount on a GT. That pinch weld got in the way on mine even without a spacer. So that has to be cut or massaged or hammered out of the way and it can be pretty inelegant to deal with. So my solution was simply to relieve the top of my valve cover, which I'm using a Fox style valve cover, which is a pretty low profile piece to begin with. And we had to hog that out essentially with a flap wheel and reseal it with epoxy and plastic. It isn't pretty, but it does allow the blower to nest into place and keeps me from having to use spacers and stacking gaskets and looking at other clearance issues as the elevation goes up. This system was designed to fit under a stock hood. However, if you put a spacer on or you have a 351 engine, you've gotten the lower manifold, all bets are off. You're definitely going to have to check your clearances, run a different hood, and look at your motor mount solutions to figure out how you're going to fit all of this into that same footprint. Let's talk about a few more of the cons while we're looking at the total package consideration of this supercharger. It does build a tremendous amount of heat. And when we have forced induction, any sort of compression does result in heat in the air charge, and this blower is no exception. The issue here that we've come to expect with modern vehicles is the provision of an intercooler. And simply put, there's no practical way to intercool a Kenny Bell on a 5-liter pushrod. There's a couple of different reasons for that. One is that hood clearance thing where they wanted it to fit under the factory hood. Two, the location of the lower intake manifold and the style it is. It's a wet manifold. It's also the splash shield for the lifter valley and because of that there's no easy way to sink an air to water intercooler in there like we see with modern modulars and other applications uh, outside of the Ford uh, powertrains. So is what they did is they tried their best to manage airflow through or uh, boost temperatures through this boost bypass and the boost bypass would allow it when it was idling and not being used to maintain a relatively cold air charge, but when you're actually wide open throttle, this would close, you get full boost and full heat. So this made engines a little bit more prone to detonation in hot weather. It made them much more oxygen sensitive. I know for mine, I have a tweaker, which I have four different calibrations loaded in there. And the difference between them all is simply the spark map. I have my, it's cold and everything is excellent, where I run about 16 degrees of total timing with uh, about 10 pounds of boost. However, in areas where it gets hot and I notice a little bit of ping, I've got a minus two and then a minus four wide open throttle timing. And then for a place where I get bad fuel, which has actually happened on a road trip once, I have a base 10 where timing is locked at base 10 to keep this thing from pinging and rattling if you get bad fuel. So you always want to run the highest octane fuel you can. You want to run octane booster or race gas even wherever you can get that. But for practicality of daily operation, it's something to consider. Hot temps, hot boost temps, detonation prone. Let's talk about some of the pros. This supercharger provides an awesome sound. I think it's one of the main reasons why these blowers have the legend that they do. They sound fantastic and the 0304 Terminator Cobras when equipped with this 2.2 or the later 2.4s, they were just absolutely legendary in the early days of internet video. I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of us would gravitate to a blower like this and try to accept its compromises. This is that cool sound and it's got presence. It is huge. When you open under the hood, it is a very big footprint under there and it's definitely got that burger stand appeal. Secondly, and perhaps the most practical, is its power production. It does produce a tremendous amount of torque. The boost is near instantaneous. When you compare this to another 
uh, more common blower like a Vortec or a Paxton where they're winding up to peak boost. This one comes in very early. You get a ton of average usable torque, which is great on the street and also very quick. But it does come at that tray where you don't have the intercooler and you are carrying around quite a bit more weight than your average Vortex system. It is fairly reliable. I've had absolutely no troubles related to the blower. I know some other folks have it. But aside from that, it is pretty robust. Once it's in there, it tends to be in there. The other thing that makes the Kenny Bell excellent is relatively easy boost changes. Now, these pulleys, I'm not sure if they're still available through Kenny Bell, but when they shipped, you could basically get one single pulley and then buy additional pulleys for additional cost. They are made of steel, which is one of the things that Kenny Bell notes that your warranty is void if you use an aluminum pulley. I have absolutely no idea why that is or how much validity there is to it. However, I've always maintained using factory Kenny Bell pulleys. Right now, this is equipped with a 3.5 inch pulley. And of course, boost versus power versus airflow will vary a lot engine by engine. But in my application, a three and a half inch pulley nets me roughly 10 pounds of boost is what it should calculate out to. On the gauge, I see about eight and a half to nine, depending on the weather, because I have a high flow head. Additionally, I have this two and three quarter inch pulley, which you can see there's two numbers on here. It will make 14 pounds with a stock lower and it will make six pounds with an underdrive. You can also experiment with underdrive pulleys to again, alter your boost ratios. And then here we have the party pulley as Finnegan might call it. This is the two and a quarter inch and this will build 18 pounds of boost on the stock lower. When Kenny Bell was advertising these blowers in the day, they were saying that this blower, this configuration was good to 24 pounds of boost. There's a ton of asterisks and small print after that to talk about race gas and drag use. You wouldn't want to street drive this for sure, relating to those high IATs, intake air temperatures you would get. However, it would be completely reasonable to periodically race gas only run on 18 pounds. I've got it here. You can see it's never been used. This one here I used to run. Uh, just briefly, and I think I'll go back to it, but it's what I did is as I was going through some teething problems that were related to things relating to my own engine, uh, my timing uh, chain and my lifters were a little weak and that was giving some drivability issues I was trying to get to the bottom of. I've moved back down to the 10, but I'll probably resume with the 14 a little later on once I get this all back together. Now, since these kits have been out of production for a long time, we only have our pick and choose of what's available for sale from people who have held on to it or have moved on to a different power adder or sold their vehicle entirely. And sometimes the thing that I can see is different blowers for different applications. You can have the SN95 kit and the Fox kit. And fundamentally, all of these pieces are the same. The blower case is the same, but the snout and the remainder of the kit is quite different for an SN95. The snout length on an SN95 is 11 inches from the case here to the end of the pulley, or it's about 10 and 7 eighths if the pulley isn't available for the measurement. If the snout is longer, that means it's for a Fox application. And the next most common question that I get from folks is, can I adapt this Fox one to my SN95? Yes, you can, but is what you have to do is you have to convert the entire front dress of your SN95 to a Fox style accessory drive. That's your belt, that's your alternator, brackets, that's your water pump. Uh, any of those pieces have to be changed over to a Fox style to account for the longer snout because what happens is you'll end up with belt misalignment and you won't be able to drive the supercharger correctly. And if you've ever looked at an SN95 versus a Fox, they have a much more compact front accessory drive and this blower is set up to deal with that. You'll also notice your front snout support bracket is unique to the SN95. That again has to be matched up with whatever accessory drive solution you go with. But my best recommendation is get an SN95 kit verify it's an SN95 and only do that. Don't try and backfit a Fox style. It's just simply not worth your time. When inspecting a Kenny Bell, it's important to look at the overall condition of all the components. You can see mine's got a little bit of surface rust here or there. Moisture attacks things that are untreated. But look for dents and dings and cracks or repairs or missing pieces and bolts because a lot of these things you can figure out, but where Kenny Bell doesn't have these in production anymore, pieces may get a little bit difficult to find. So when you look at the snout and the drive, it's really difficult to inspect the rotors without disassembling the manifolds, both the discharge side and the inlet side. And if you buy one of these off the internet, chances are it's going to be fully assembled and most likely no one's going to take it apart and show you what the inside of the rotors look like. The danger there is I have seen a couple of these used units where there's been a piece of debris that's been fed through the blower drive, it goes through the screws, damages them, 
they're ruined. You generally have a thousand plus dollar paperweight at that point. They are completely unsalvageable without swapping very expensive parts. It's best to get a good one the first time than trying to repair someone else's problem. Now, if you are able to physically inspect it inside, you wanna basically do an external on the blower drive. You take a look at the oil level. The oil level is extremely important on these. It's noted in the instructions that you'll see that there's two little hash marks. It's gonna be between these two little marks and run the correct style of oil. If there's not enough, it'll starve the bearings and then the bearings will of course come out of tolerance and that'll ruin the blower pack. Again, the same thing as feeding a rock through it. If it's too high, there is a soft uh, cush drive or a spider coupling in here. It's basically a piece of plastic that keeps the gears from getting lashed whenever the engine makes a rapid change in engine speed so you don't get a driveline lash through here, and it's a cush drive. If you have too much oil, the oil gets hot and apparently it damages that, melts them. And if you don't have a proper spider coupling, I believe they're still available, but still, it's best not to deal with that. One of the ways to check and see if the, if the spider coupling's in any good condition is you simply rotate the blower by hand back and forth, and you listen for any binding or any noises, and then you simply do a quick wobble back and forth, and you might hear a little tick, 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 that's fine, but if you hear any large amounts of lash and free play, this one's fairly tight. It only has about 16,000 miles on it since I've owned it, so it's all still very tight, but once this gets worn, it absolutely has to be replaced, otherwise you're going to have a lot of problems with your blower drive and general performance. I've seen a couple of later model ones that had some abuse on uh, Shelby's. When these go, it's very apparent. You'll get quite a bit of lash between them. You'll hear a clacking noise as you rotate them. But generally, the blower should spin freely with hand effort. We can hear that as the blower goes through and compresses. You'll also want to check the actuation on the bypass. You hear that puffing noise. That means the diaphragm is in good condition. If the diaphragm is wrecked, you're going to have to get a new one. I do not know where the replacement parts for these are available. Contact Kenny Bell and see what they have. But this is your bypass valve. Anything else it comes with, if it's missing this assembly, you're probably in trouble. It's going to be a little bit of a pain to uh, rework this. Look for anything that's been cross-threaded or taken apart. Okay, so now we're looking at the underside of the blower as we kind of continue our inspection. And is what you'll see here, the underside on a five liter push rod is actually the top side on one of those Terminator blowers when these were the same head unit that was used. Notice we have a top discharge, the Cobras have a, a bottom discharge. Uh, that's all they did, they just flipped the blower over and changed where the inlet bolts on. So you can see here we have the staggered eight ports. That tells you that this is set up for a Cobra intake manifold. This is because I ordered it this way. They come in two major flavors, Cobra, and standard GT, and the standard GT is an inline system where you can see the eight oval ports. You'll probably see that in the roll-in in a moment. Now, when we say Cobra, people use the terms Cobra, GT40, and Explorer interchangeably, and largely they are with this port design, but they are not truly. Uh, Thomas Moss of TMOS Porting from the old days of the internet, he had noted that there was some problems with fitting these manifolds onto different cars that had maybe one swapped on because like most of you, I have a GT, I put a Cobra lower manifold on it because I wanted the higher flowing lower and I wanted this Cobra pattern of lower manifold. So it all stands to reason you would go with that. I sourced mine from Ford Racing after careful consideration of reviewing TMOS Porting's uh, review on the documents. It turns out that this blower is completely incompatible with a Ford Explorer GT40 style or Explorer lower manifold. Is what it is is there's something in the casting between where these front two bolts go and how they line up with the ports that the snout doesn't line up where it should and it will basically shred belts over and over again. So you can imagine how frustrating that may have been. These were decidedly built for 1994 and 1995 Cobras and then they were also able to fit certain Ford Racing lower manifolds. You can do some research on TMOS Racing's site, and he has his old documents where he does the measurements, and they are indeed different. I didn't believe it myself, but take a look at the documents. It gets very clear. On the underside, there isn't really too much going on to look at. We want to look for any sort of blower damage. We want to look for anything that's out of place, big dents or cracks. You'll notice this notch here, and you'll see that there's been some grinding. That's been done by me with a die grinder. That's in order to fit the fuel pressure regulator under hood. You have to use a factory fuel pressure regulator, you have to cut the bar back, and you have to bend it at this really obtuse angle. And it's tough to do. I used an Allen key after breaking one. 
And the reason is, is this blower manifold on the Flowzillas specifically is so thick and so big here that it doesn't allow you to access the vacuum port reference on your uh, fuel pressure regulator. Also is what this means, if you have an aftermarket fuel pressure regulator, like one of those nice aeromotive units, like I used to have, it's useless to you, it's gone. You gotta throw it away. Furthermore, if you are not using a stock style fuel rail, you're going to run into some troubles there. And where I haven't experimented with uh, aftermarket fuel rails on this setup, I don't really quite know what those problems are, but trust me, your clearance in here is way tighter than you want it to be and very uncomfortable. While we're looking at the underside, we can see that there's six bolts and that's all pretty straightforward. On this side, on the top side, there's usually a stud in place or a bolt that you can use. These two on the end aren't too bad, but these two back here, they are nightmarish. You have to have studs. You end up having to either cut down a wrench or end up using small 3 8 head ARP nuts. That's a huge problem to get in there. It's a really, really uh, unpleasant place to be. And then also on this one here, this one's not quite as bad, but it's still not very good. You're in there with a box end wrench, spinning it on a little bit at a time. It's really, truly a pain. These things uh, perform well once they're in place, but I cannot stress enough how much the fitment seems like you're adapting something that doesn't belong there. So that wraps up our episode on the Kenny Bell Supercharger for the SN95 5 liters. Hopefully you found this informative. If you have any questions or comments, please hit us up in the comments section below. And if you like this sort of thing, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. We'll see you next time.